Welcome to the Wellness and Recovery channel. Today I'm going to show you the first half of my experimental build and testing of the geyser airlift pump. My first attempt to build a geyser pump was not very successful. I used a bottle from dried onion powder for a body. I used a syringe and a piece of bent acrylic pipe for a siphon itself. And I used a flap valve. Flap valve did not hold back pressure because I made it out of wrinkly piece of vinyl. So I tried a different design. I used those replacement PVC caps for door stoppers and BBs for a BB gun. I made a body out of a PVC pipe by sanding it against the belt center like so to give it flat edges. And then I made other faces of the valve out of thick acrylic plexiglass. And I actually had to redo it once again because of some mistakes that I made. The actual siphon was made out of aquarium tubing and a T splitter. I used threaded barbed hose connectors. And in order to thread them into the top plate of the pump, I had to drill holes and then tap them with a tap. In order to do that, I had to drill a hole that is slightly smaller in diameter than the tap. While the recommended diameter for a drill to be used for an M5 thread is 4.20 millimeters, I used an 11 64th of an inch drill in order to make a hole. And that drill is equal to 4.20 3656 millimeters according to the table that I used. This is the only drill bit that I had that was appropriate. The tap and die kit also included this wonderful tool for measuring thread pitch. However, I did not exactly trust it because I didn't have enough thread length to work with. So I used a more traditional way. I took a known M5 bolt and I threaded a nut onto it to make sure that it's a uh, M5 nut and then I use this nut to check the thread on the barbed fitting to make sure that it's also an M5. Now I knew what tap to use. And in this kit there were two types of taps for M5. One had a 0 0.8 millimeter pitch and another had a 0 0.9 millimeter pitch which is a very strange size that I had never seen in any metric thread tables. There are other fine thread pitches for M5. So I laid the tap that was 0 0.8 millimeter pitch against the bolt to make sure that it's the right thread and I used it to tap two holes in the top plate of my improvised geyser pump. A long, long time ago I used to have a 3D printer and unfortunately my 3D printer broke from static discharge and by the time it broke it was already obsolete. It was one of those early versions of 3D printers and I could not buy another motherboard so I sold it for parts. And when I had a 3D printer I would print things with threads already in them and then use taps and dies only to clean up clean up the threads to make sure that things go in tightly but not too tightly to to break parts or to strip threads out. I really wish I had my 3D printer so I could design several geyser pumps and say, see which geyser pump design is better. This is the approach that I would have taken if I had my 3D printer handy. I would just add different variations in the design and CAD software and generate different models and print them and test them all at once. Unfortunately I had to give up my 3D printer because it was too costly to maintain and to repair and here I'm building everything by hand. I had to borrow a holder for the taps from a, an inch tap and die set because the metric one came with a very cheap and low quality tool that I couldn't really use to hold a tap this small. It would just 
not stay there. And here is why I decided to use a geyser pump for permaculture projects. In this pump I ran into a problem that I used isopropyl alcohol to clean the parts and at some point the parts, especially the tapped holes, started to crack. And that is the problem because isopropyl tends to crack plastics, some plastics. Acrylic sheet, I believe, is one of them. And uh, I had to take the pump apart, throw away the cracked parts, test my new choice for a solvent on a scrap of acrylic plastic that was not related to the pump. And uh, I had to redo everything pretty much. And yes, my pencil box also shows signs of cracks probably from isopropyl alcohol that someone used to clean it at some point. Not me because I found it in trash. I glued everything together with hot glue. It required me to invent a lot of technological operations on the go. I did not film every operation that I had to redo because of the cracking of the plastic. So here I'm showing you the basic step. It did take me a fair amount of time to put the body of the pump together. And in the end it came out pretty nicely, except the pump did not work exactly as I expected. I will read advantages and disadvantages of the geyser pumps in my next video and tell you why I decided that they're very important for my permaculture projects to an extent that I really, really need to develop my own model to do anything else. I would like to use cheap aquarium pumps that have electromagnets and silicone bellows so they can bubble it through the aquarium water and aerate it. In this case I need a design of a geyser pump that would not require too much air pressure to operate and I did not exactly accomplish that and I learned some useful lessons in geyser pump design. I've done a lot of research. I looked for ways to calculate their characteristics and I realized that a lot of it is very empirical, especially when, when tube diameters are low enough to create those capillary effects. My pump design was inspired by the video that I found on Lock Lab YouTube channel and uh, this animation illustrates how it should work in theory. However, when I built it, I discovered that that's not exactly how it works in real life. I would really like to use a Tesla valve instead of a ball valve or a flat valve in my next geyser pump design and I would probably make it a several stage pump. I want to build a Tesla valve array that would have air blow being blown into different segments of the Tesla valve to drive water in one direction and not put, let it out in the other direction. So thank you Jimmy Locke for inspiring me. I really like your animation and the way my pump worked was a little different. The pumps of the body that extend above the siphon or below the siphon are not really involved in doing any pumping work. The air filled cavity at the top of the pump actually acts as a spring and adds an interesting effect. In my case the pump worked the best when the siphon was not allowed to fill up with water. When it did the pump just sat there and the air supply pump didn't have enough power to overcome the mass of the water. So the pump worked very well in this micro oscillation mode. However it did not remain very stable in that mode and 
occasionally it would blow out all the water and not allow itself to refill so it would just sit there and the air from the air supply pump would just blow through the geyser pump thank you for watching the wellness and recovery channel